officially uh, call the HR meeting to order. Uh, <clears throat> we have, do you have any citizens wishing to speak? Okay. There being none, we will go on with our agenda, and our next on our agenda is approval of the minutes from our July meeting. To All right, thank Second. you. All right, uh, there being uh, no further discussions, all those uh, approved signify by saying aye. Aye. All right, <laughs> that was unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I see this going to be one of those those quick meetings today. So next we have uh, Nikki uh, Ms. Sumter for employee retention, and uh, we're ready. Yes, thank you. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about our turnover and retention information. Um, I have attached some information for the board portal. In addition, we are displaying it live uh, for those in the audience. I know it may be a little hard to see. Um, we've talked a lot over the last um, several years, actually, about the need to retain our workforce. And we have engaged a, a full talent management strategy around that. Um, we talk a lot about employee engagement. We talk about total rewards and compensation and our ability to deliver a good learning and development environment. Um, a part of that is to keep our eye on some key metrics. So one of those metrics is our turnover rate. Um, what we have displayed is the <coughs> turnover rate for each executive uh, group. Um, our turnover is calculated, um, and this is an annualized view of turnover. Um, for the last 11 months up through August 31st of 2016. Uh, it's terminations divided by our number of actives, divided by the number of months within the period, and multiplied by 12. And so as you can see, um, the turnover uh, for each executive um, who is responsible for their division um, related to turnover. I will point out there are some with lower FTEs, and so if anyone were to leave in that grouping, of course, the percentage would be slightly higher. The top three voluntary reasons, reasons for departure are other employment and career advancement, resignation, and personal or family um, concerns. Involuntary, um, at 3.13% 3 .3, 3 overall, our top three reasons are work in work performance, policy violation, and inappropriate behavior. And so we take pride in having, um, making sure that our teams live to our standards of behavior. But as you can see, only 3.13% of our workforce is involuntarily terminated. And 12.2% uh, voluntarily left JPS. We use Saratoga, PricewaterhouseCooper um, to set our benchmark rates. As of right now, um, the benchmark total for total turnover, voluntary turnover, is 12.1%, and we are right at 12.2. And we benchmark against like organizations. So um, that gives you an overview of our turnover as of right now. We have some departments, very large departments, who are doing quite well in um, keeping their turnover very low, um, such as the OR, who um, is really less than 5% overall. Um, our NICU, um, which has received um, a lot of activity lately and their days, um, uh, average length of stay right now is um, fairly, fairly high itself a bit. And so their turnover is less than 3% overall this year. So that's really good. Um, ICU is right at benchmark and stop six is below 10%. There are some departments who have experienced a higher degree of turnover. Um, some of our clinic locations, employee health, occupational health, a few of our nursing units, but not very many, which is really good, our admissions holding, oncology unit, um, and some of our corporate settings like HIM. Um, are receiving um, slightly higher than normal turnover, but certainly we have action plans so, and we'll work with those departments to keep turnover low. Do you have um, Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I'll wait. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the information you just gave us, do I have that? Yeah. It should be on the board portal. 
Okay. And the in regards to the departments, the individual departments, no, you do not have that level of detail. Oh. You have the roll up. Okay. I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay. You have the roll up. But those departments that I mentioned um, are certainly uh, we have available in a detailed report. Okay. Then, then on the annualized turnover. Yes. I guess what I'm trying to grab is this question is there a scale of from good to bad or um, I would say the benchmark um, that that lets us know how far off the mark we are um, as it relates to voluntary turnover when we put in our data for Saratoga like organizations like in they look at size number of FT mm -hmm. etc we're at 12.2. Our benchmark, um, our recent benchmark with Saratoga is 12.1. So we're slightly higher. I, don't, I would, don't know if it's statistically significant, um, but we are slightly higher than the benchmark. Um, as you can see, our involuntary turnover is really low. Um, if you will, will recall a few, probably about a year ago, I put up a slide that um, demonstrated turnover over the last 20 years at JPS. And it, it has consistently gone down. Um, and it was as high in the high 20s at one point. Um, I believe our turnover, if we continue on the same track to September 30th, we may hit 15.33. If we have a great month this month, um, we will be lower than 15.33. Okay. And that will be consistent with our 2015 turnover report. Mm -hmm. So we're almost right around where we've been hovering the last, um, over the last year, uh, year and a half. I do appreciate you giving us the turnover report. What I would like to see added in the future is when we come with our annual turnover, then you have a comparison of where we were for that same period, so, okay. we, so we can see. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I think it's important that we look at turnover I, I, um, and track it. And I'm trying to, I, I received, you know, I received something I'm, I'm, I'll share with you about how other HR uh, committees are looking at turnover and following different HR keys uh, indicators in their, in their uh, committee. So I'll share that with you. But one of the things is that they are looking at turnover as a comparison, you know, so that you can see last year, some of them are doing it quarterly, so that they can see if they're having an up and down. And I think that would be beneficial. Absolutely. Okay. We can right. do that. Okay, and and then uh, I'll just share your report because I can't remember all the stuff I uh, I was going to talk about um, because one of the deals with turnover is the other deal that they were looking at was your recruitment cost. Have we got a cap on recruitment costs for, and are we staying within that? That was the other With key indicator that they were looking at on their in their committee. So I thought that might be something that we might want to look at. Okay. Well, I want to thank um, Nikki and this committee, particularly in the area of nursing. Nikki and Bill and Sharon and even prior to Sharon worked really hard at dealing with our nursing issues. Those numbers used to be significantly right. higher. Mm -hmm. As you remember from your time here, 50 cents makes a difference. Right. And we've begun to do much more in the area of aggressive market studies mm -hmm. to know so that we're not caught behind. Right. You do not want that number, particularly in some of your key areas such as nursing, to be at 20% or 22%. You really begin to affect your, you don't get HCAP scores in the 87 percentile when you have a turnover rate that is so high. So I want to applaud Nikki, Bill, and our finance team and you all for approving it because if you don't address those issues, they only become significantly greater. Right. Well, one thing I, I, I still remember two or three years ago, 
doing the conversion of Epic. Yes. The turnover is so high in IT and IS, mm -hmm. and it's pretty low on yes. here also. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the only one thing that I suggest is it's kind of hard cause unless you know who they are, what department that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the detail can, report. Uh, no, it's it just we don't if we don't know the name. Yeah, on the executive administration, put the department, department, not okay. just yes. the name, because you may, you may not know mm -hmm. that um, you know, certain people on there have certain department on what their duties are. That's a good point. What, 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 what happened to Robert Early's department? <laughs> I was trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to so, figure out who that From are. a data perspective, <laughs> there are some areas um, that are coded to Mr. Early, um, such as our foundation. Um, and the in administration, those are the two departments, and um, that is how you get an active list of 30.25. Again, that is an average employee headcount for this entire period. Um, so the foundation and the administrative team fall in that grouping. I think without I without putting <laughs> right. volunteer in volunteers. <laughs> So certainly we will expand the report. Please know that it will be longer than one page, but we will expand the report to make sure that um, we include the information you requested. Okay. And Perfect. thank you, Ms. Chairman, for calling that out. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else have any? Thanks, Nikki. You're welcome. Okay, I am pleased uh, to have with me, I have uh, two other folks that will be joining us at the table, but one is already sitting here, and that's Dow Tucker. I asked her to sit up here. Dow is um, currently our Executive Director of um, Human Resources, and she is responsible for working with the two fabulous individuals to my right um, in the acclaimed physician, acclaimed physician group. Say that fast with braces. <laughs> And so um, we are certainly thankful um, that Dow joined our team. Um, she, we recruited her from Salem, Oregon, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm correct. And uh, where she did similar work. Diana um, met Dow, had two really strong candidates, and met Dow and said she is the one. And so um, we are so glad to have Dow as a part of the team. And I am going to turn it over to Dow and you know the two folks over here to the right, Diana and Dr. Johnson, to give an update on provider recruitment. Thank you, Nikki. So today I'm gonna to walk you through the state of physician recruitment, actually provider recruitment, and some of the great work that we've done in Acclaim. Looking at some of the data that we have here, fiscal year to date, we have 42 provider hires. Um, we have nine that will be starting in the months of October and November. This does not include, we also have 25 future hires, which are UNT providers that will be joining us from now um, through 2018. We consider them hires if we have a signed agreement. So if you total that number, we have 67 providers that will be joining as future hires for us. Currently, right now, we have 39 vacancies. This also includes the UNT vacancies that we inherited as well with our um, latest transition. And then I also included the breakdown of how many physician openings we have and advanced practitioners as well. Most of the openings that we have would be in our primary care area. This slide I'm very much excited about, and it can be a little deceiving when you look at the number to say, Dow, why are you excited about 39? I can tell you that we have an active pipeline of candidates for each of these areas. So for an example, in primary care, we have six provider openings, well, six physician openings. I have eight physician candidates in the pipeline. Neurology has been an area that I understand has been a challenge over the last 24 months. Currently, right now in that area, we have two physician openings and I have six viable candidates. So we have a lot of great activity that's happening in recruitment. Um, so that's why I get excited about this slide. If you look at the numbers on the bottom, um, days open on average is roughly over four months. Um, we have been trending that we will close a vacancy or we'll fill a position within 4.4 months. Well, that's a great set yeah. of physicians. <laughs> yeah, but that's wow. a good target. It is. 
looking at provider turnover, so this data includes JPSPG in a claim terminations that we've had. These are voluntary terminations. Um, I want to add that out of the 14, two of them have returned. So really the number is 12, right? They couldn't stay away. Um, the six that you see for new opportunities, I can tell you that we had one provider that wanted to open up private practice. Three of them wanted to pursue academic um, opportunities. And then two actually wanted to pursue leadership positions. When you look at most recent literature, some data that we have regarding um, provider turnover, when you look at AMGA, uh, Cheka, Merritt Hawkins, on average, uh, physician turnover is about 7% nationwide. For advanced practitioners, it runs about 10 to 12%. For us here in Acclaim, um, collectively, we average 7.9. That's our turnover rate, which is pretty good. Where we are today, so currently we have 409 Acclaim employees, and I've also included the breakdown of providers and staff. If you look at um, the transition rate, so when we uh, launched Acclaim August, actually not August, April 28th for May 1st start, we transitioned 100% of the providers from PG Group over to Acclaim. We did not lose one. With UNT to Acclaim, we transitioned 97% of the providers. So we roughly had 3% who decided not to join Acclaim. Anyone have any questions? Uh, now, first of all, thank you for coming and giving us the first uh, provider report. That's really helpful in looking at what's going on and and seeing if there's anything the HR committee could do to help with any of the strategies and recruitment and all of that. But um, it's a good report. It's, it's our first, so we're just kind of sitting here thinking, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a good aha uh -huh moment. Did you have something? No, I just thought, also I thought it was just a good report. I'm just surprised at the positive side on the numbers, you know, just you, based on what you were receiving <laughs> going in. Man, this is awesome. Man, I'm yeah. slow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I am glad to see the, 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 the recruitment effort and and i know how hard that is so i am very pleased with that and glad to glad that you're here right i'm glad you. that you well, both of you are here thank you and dr johnson I'm, I'm very glad that you accept the position and i look forward to working with you and and helping in any way that the hr committee can thank okay. you mr bose likewise all right Anyone I think, else? I think by accepting the position of pres president of a claim, it took him off of about six committees. <laughs> so, uh, I, I thought he was just noble in taking the position. Now I think it's just cut his workload significantly. It is significantly better. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? You know, I just want to say that when you look at this countywide, nationwide, and, and the need for providers, in the system, we look real good. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think it helps when you know you have yeah. the openings that you do, you can start recruiting. Because on the primary care, I'm hoping that as classes get ready to graduate, we will start identifying those that we really want to keep uh, and, and start recruiting them early. Because that, you know, when you have such a large program, that should be one of the main areas that we recruit from. And that would be one of those that I would think that you'd come and say, we got a waiting list for folks wanting to work in. Okay. Well, the question is mm -hmm. uh, unrelated to this a little okay. bit. It has to do with the new implementation of the new minimum wages coming in December 1st. Mm -hmm. Are we reviewing Absolutely. everything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And what DT is referring to is um, the, there were some changes um, to the exempt, exemption classifications and under the Fair Labor Standards Act. We have very few um, team members who um, are impacted, but okay. certainly we are creating a plan. We um, budgeted appropriately just in case um, we see that there is going to be any uptick 
in salary expense, but we are prepared for that. Okay. And we have um, a work plan around that. Now that you two know all that, what are y'all talking about? <laughs> there is a, um, a change to sal the salary exemption status. Okay. Um, Non-exempt, which many call hourly, and um, exempt or salary basis. And there is a change in the overtime rule um, that okay. there's a t change in the threshold, let okay. me say that. And so with that change in threshold, who would qualify for overtime, et cetera, we need to have a plan in place to make sure that we appropriately pay individuals. All right. It's basically Did I say that correctly? put the, um, put the uh, minimum side of it. Right. The minimum impact would be just require $913 per week. So it's about 47000 plus a year oh. for, the, for the minimum side. Okay. And then there's a uh, high compensated one, which start from 100 and move to 134. And so for our nurses, when you think of nursing, they, mm -hmm. are, are, um, they would be affected if they were not already non-exempt. Right. Okay. So that we would be concerned about our nursing group, but they're already not exempt. Non -exempt mm -hmm. right. And so we are already paying them for the overtime hours that they work. Okay. But again, there are some classifications yeah. we're taking a look at to make sure mm -hmm. that um, we we stay within the right parameters. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Mr. Mr. I'll just say one quick thing, and really that's a thank you to, to, to you all at the table as well as, as all these folks in terms of physician recruitment. Um, the bottom line is, as Reverend said, we do look good. Um, but that really is, uh, I just want to give you my opinion on why that is right now, especially so early on. Um, for physicians, taking, keeping, staying in a job really boils down to uh, predictability and, mm -hmm. and belief in the mission. Uh, we, both the staff and the board, have established a very clearly articulated mission for what we do. Uh, and it's a very noble mission. On top of that, it, the, we have the additional layer of um, physician groups around the country clunking around on how they're dealing with value-based purchasing and how they compensate physicians. I think we are actually ahead of the curve uh, on that one with, uh, with our, our, our partners and consultants at Jay Taylor, uh, how, we, how we hold our physicians accountable and align with the organization uh, in terms of quality and productivity and set, setting for, forward uh, very clear expectations. Having that level of predictability sets us up to do very well, and I think that's why we are where we are. So uh, very, I would, I would love to say we should take all the credit for this, but, but much of this credit goes to the work the board and, and the staff have done historically to, to clearly articulate that mission and vision, and then we're able to pass that on, and then the consultants uh, that, you, you know, utilizing Jay Taylor and being able to clearly articulate to our physicians and advanced practice professionals uh, this is how we align with the organization, and this is how your compensation will encourage you to align with the organization. So just my two cents, but I, right. I, I thank, thank you to you all for, for what you do. All right. Anything else? Well, Nikki, you're still up. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, you can stay there. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, too. <laughs> Okay, our next topic is succession planning, and um, Mr. Early and I will talk a little bit about um, this topic. Um, one of the things we've been doing over the last two years is really begin to try, kind of figure out how we want the succession planning process to go. We started with, um, you know, we definitely needed to identify emergency short term for our CEO should something occur, but also to plan long-term for the entire executive team and the rest of our leadership team. We've talked about learning and development and how that plays a role um, and how we need to move forward. Um, Ms. DeVoe and I had a conversation um, last week about, you know, what could we do moving forward? Um, the suggestion was potentially a policy or um, we create a structure around succession planning. I had a conversation with Mr. Early, and he and I um, kind of came up with what we believe is a really good plan. 
um, we would like to engage with the Exeter group to help us in documenting, further documenting our process. Certainly, we documented, again, what our short-term plan will be, and that is in place. But we do need a longer-term plan, and we recognize that. And so, um, Mr. Early, would you like to add anything? Yeah, what we, what we did is we opened up lines of communication with Exeter for two reasons. One, they have um, uh, the expertise that this issue of succession planning is in their wheelhouse. It's what they've done. They've provided this information for other groups. And to Nikki's point, with your interest in your drive, Mr. Wynn's drive, and others, how do we develop the right succession plan for the organization? So to Nikki's point, we did short-term planning and we looked at some of the initial key components. If things were to change tomorrow, what would we do? That's one phase, one plan, one reaction. But I think the bigger part is what do you do succession planning for an entire network where you have 6,000 employees? Because we can talk about succession planning at key levels, but some of that succession planning is at a manager's level, at a director's level, and how do you keep that sort of continuity amongst your organization, particularly an organization which is going in the right direction? How do you keep that going so you don't have any level of wholesale change at any one time? I think it's important to our taxpayers that we communicate to them the stability of JPS in its go forward as we look at the potential for asking taxpayers for a potential bond and that they know their stability at JPS and part of that's a succession plan. So Nikki and I have had communications with Exeter and began to ask them, have you, tell us what you've done for or, other organizations. And their answers were strong and good. The other thing I like about the Exeter group is they've been here long enough now that they understand JPS. It's not just a third party national consulting organization. It's an organization that has worked with the board and it's worked with our employees and it's worked with diversity and inclusion. And I think they have a real good understanding of who this organization is. One of the biggest challenges you have with any consulting group is when you come from the outside trying to learn who we are and then you get an unfortunate cookie cutter approach and there's nothing cookie cutter about JPS. So I, th I think we're in a much better position now to enlist their help if you would ask me a year ago, should they be playing a role, it would have been more challenging because they didn't know us as well. Now the fact that they do, I think they will work with us. They've asked us if, if they could have some one-on-ones with y'all. Okay. And I think that would be really important if y'all have the, have the time and we have the cookies, I think we can make that happen. And so what we would do is put those efforts together and communicate with y'all and have that be sort of the stakeholder side of it and then meet with, with staff. But what I'm gonna to suggest to them though, is when Exeter comes in, so they, they don't just meet with the executive side. They're, they're meeting with some of our folks throughout the organization, maybe somebody that, that just joined the organization and says, tell us what you think about JPS. Where's your growth? What do you, what do you see? What do you don't see? That goes to our retention numbers as well. So I think there's um, a nice opportunity for us. But I do appreciate the patience of this committee because it's been a bit evolutionary as to how we get to that, particularly an organization that has not really addressed that <coughs> to allow us to get to the point where it is the right plan, not just a plan. Okay. Well, I really appreciate that move forward because it was going to stay on this agenda every so often until <laughs> it came. And so I appreciate the thought and and I, I do see us doing some things but I just think for an organization a health system this large we need something a little bit more formal and and uh, and I, I like that you're bringing forward someone to help you with that thank you so we won't put it on next month we'll we'll come back it'll be a little <laughs> give us 60 days thank you we'll take your 60 days <laughs> no, Christine, we, we'll, we'll take as much time as we need but it is important. That is one of the deals that is in our little charter. And, you know, I'm real one of those that check off everything in my little box that's, that's in our little box to do. So we will do it. Yes, ma'am. We are aware of that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. That is all we have in open session. We need to reconvene in closed session to, um, to discuss some personnel issues. Okay. Well, whatever that topic is, in personnel, this Texas right. government code right. and all that, okay? Is Chuck on vacation?
good. Okay. All right. We can uh, reconvene to uh, open meeting. There be no further business, then we're dismissed. Good job. Thanks. Good.